Good morning, everyone. Um, I've introduced myself before, but my name is Kara Skrubis. I'm an Ostia Warrior Junior Advisory Board member and former Junior Advisory Board President, as well as MIB Agent Social Media Manager. Um, I'm sure I will see you all in the days to come with my Instagram Live in your face. It is my honor to introduce to Troy McEttrin, our Biomarkers Panel Moderator. Dr. McEttrin earned his doctorate in molecular and cellular pathology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2011. He completed his postdoctoral fellowship at St. Jude Children's Hospital at the Translational Genomics Research Institute in 2016. Dr. McEttrin joined the faculty of the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California as an assistant professor in the Department of Translational Genomics and the Department of Pediatrics. Dr. McEttrin joined the Pediatric Oncology Branch at the National Cancer Institute in 2021, where he leads the Integrated Solid Tumor Biology section. The major focus of his laboratory is to molecularly dissect the microenvironment of pediatric me metastatic osteosarcoma to better understand the biology of metastatic disease and identify therapeutically actionable targets. So without further ado, I give you Dr. McEttrin. All right, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to moderate. Last year I got to do this, but um, the joys of being a federal employee is that they like, kind of cancel your travel whenever they feel fit. So I got to do it uh, virtually last year, so doing it in person this year is much better. Um, so first I just wanna quickly say, give, us, give all of yourselves a, a round of applause for being here and just being committed to uh, what we're all here to do because as you've heard osteo really stinks So the fact that we're all here trying to do something positive and transformative for this disease and the patients and the families um, That's remarkable. So thank everyone for for being here for that uh, So I have four minutes and 16 seconds to introduce our panel, so I will go ahead and get started. So we have Josh Nash from the Hospital for Sick Children, and Josh is a PhD student, so make sure your questions are extra tough, <laughs> so that this is in preparation for his dissertation defense, so let's make this really, really difficult for him. Um, so he's here from the uh, Hospital for Sick Children, and he's going to be talking about developing a transcriptional atlas of sarcoma. Um, Jovana Pavisic, perfect, um, from Columbia University. Uh, she's talking about a systems biology approach to defining tumor heterogeneity and prognostic targetable, prognostic and targetable master regulator signatures from bulk and single cell RNA sequencing. So it's a really long title, so she also deserves extremely hard questions from the panel. <laughs> um, this last name I'm going to butcher 100%, so I apologize ahead of time, even though I've already asked how to pronounce it. Um, Kelly Mikelski? Okay, wonderful. Um, from University of Minnesota, talking about identification of serum exosomal gene signatures associated with prognosis in pediatric osteos. Kelly Rankin from uh, New North of England Bone and Soft Tissue Tumor Service, talking about the iconic study. David Schulman from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute talking about um, circulating tumor DNA as a prognostic biomarker for risk stratification and localized osteosarcoma, um, insights from the leopard study. And Diane Deal from Count Me In, which is one of my favorite, favorite groups of all time, um, talking about the osteosarcoma and Lyomire sarcoma Count Me In project from the Cancer Moonshot. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for being here, for listening to the panel. Super hard questions for the first two, and then, you know, the remaining four just, just go real easy. So I think we'll be good. Uh, thank you, Troy, for that introduction, and uh, thank you to the whole MIB team, especially to Christina uh, for this whole uh, project. So yes, uh, I'll be speaking about developing a transcriptional atlas of sarcoma. So over the past 10 years, there have been multiple parallel efforts uh, to sequence massive data sets of uh, patient-derived cancers. And there are just a few up here, uh, both pediatric and adult uh, efforts. 
And this massive amount of uh, patient-derived data allows us to take a new perspective and an unprecedented view of really all of cancer at multiple resolutions and to understand how different diagnoses rela uh, relate and develop. And we can also now discover novel distinctions both between and within diagnoses. And we've chosen to uh, focus on tumor RNA-seq, so uh, gene expression data, uh, to do this because we can get easy access to marker genes, gene expression programs, and developmental modules. And this is particularly important for sarcomas, which are, as many of you know, the most poorly understood and diagnostically challenging of all uh, cancer types. And they also require much better prognostication at the time of diagnosis, uh, independent of clinical presentation. Uh, so when I came into my lab as a master's student, um, a very talented postdoc in my lab, Dr. Federico Comitani, amalgamated many of these uh, sequencing efforts together into one gigantic data set of over 13,000 samples, all of them uniformly processed. Um, and he created this algorithm called RACCOON, uh, which stands for Resolution Adaptive Course Defined Clusters Optimization. And what this very fancy algorithm does is it automates um, unbiased hierarchical clustering and optimizes parameters so that you can get very good clustering resolution um, at multiple uh, levels of uh, the resulting hierarchy. And what this algorithm does is it outputs this big atlas of cancer, and this is what cancer really looks like, these 13,000 cancers, at the highest hierarchical level. And we can see that really the tissue of origin and the cell of origin signal dominates at the highest level. So not only do we have a way to understand the biology of these tumors, uh, we also have a patient classifier called Otter, Oncologic Transcriptome Expression Recognition, which is a fancy uh, neural net that takes any uh, RNA sequencing sample, whether it's a patient tumor or a preclinical model, and as long as you have the RNA-seq data, it will um, uh, classify that uh, tumor uh, or sample uh, within our hierarchy. Um, and it will really do this uh, to any cluster to which there is any resemblance. So it's very useful for uh, pulling out contamination or multi-sample uh, or multi-subtype uh, samples, which are common. Uh, sarcomas uh, are here in the middle uh, in these mesenchymal clusters uh, with the exception of a single uh, sarcoma type Ewing sarcoma, which is its own distinct entity. Uh, and if any of you have any thoughts on that, I would love to uh, discuss that after. So when we look at our mesenchymal clusters, so all of sarcoma, we can see osteosarcoma forms this uh, lobe uh, in the bottom group. Um, what we see are that our classes are really distinguished by stemness um, by immune activity and by age. So the top cluster in orange, uh, these diagnoses are much more pediatric and much more stem-like. So stem-like, in fact, that when we co-cluster them with fetal bone, so really early fetal bone at eight weeks, so just really what is um, uh, condensed mesenchyme, what we find is that they are pretty much transcriptionally indistinguishable. So these uh, two sarcoma clusters represent two very uh, developmentally distinct uh, entities. Uh, and so we call them high stemness and low stemness. And osteosarcoma is sort of the exception of the low stemness group, uh, where it is the only pediatric entity amongst a sea of adult uh, entities like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma and even mesothelioma. Um, so when we look at, this is the whole uh, hierarchy of both classes. Um, they're very deep, they're very um, complex, and there are a lot of novel groups here. And we're just beginning to understand the significance of some of these groups. And we published this last year, oh, sorry, excuse me, earlier this year, uh, and please uh, read this uh, paper if you're interested. We cover several uh, pediatric tumor groups, uh, not just sarcomas. So when we look at our osteosarcoma clusters within here, again, this is hierarchical, so we can take that uh, low stemness cluster, and we can take that osteosarcoma, and then we get subclusters there. We have 155 in total in the data set, and we have about 125 go into this bona fide osteosarcoma cluster here. And what we see is that the subclusters of this osteosarcoma cluster represent four distinct entities, both prognostically and developmentally. So we see different clusters representing different part of, the, of bone development. We see osteoblastic-like cluster. We see a chondroblastic-like cluster. We see an osteoclastic cluster. And we also see a, a, a cluster in the middle that has features of all. And what we see is that there's a very distinct uh, prognosis for each of these clusters. And not only is this important for patients, but it can also tell us which uh, transcriptional signatures might be responsible for poor prognosis uh, and can be targeted. Uh, we also have several osteosarcomas that look dedifferentiated. They are transcriptionally indistinguishable from undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. And so this is another advantage to having a sort of pan-sarcoma view of uh, osteosarcoma. 
Uh, of course, we also have this patient classifier, and we took the Kids Cancer Sequencing Program, which is a precision medicine uh, program at the Hospital for Sick Children uh, for uh, children with relapsed and refractory cancer, and we ran the 300 patients at the time through Otter, our classifier, and we saw over 89% of tumors were successfully classified. So this is a very, very good classifier. And, and of course, this is a pan-cancer cohort, but looking at our osteosarcoma patients, we find that, number one, because these are high-risk patients, they go to our high-risk groups, uh, and also that the assignment is independent of uh, pre- or post-therapy. We can also classify models. So these are preclinical models from the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia, and what we find here is that many of the models of osteosarcoma don't look like osteosarcoma transcriptionally, but they look more like uh, an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, and we're not sure why this is. Uh, and we know this works in other uh, cancer types, like Ewing sarcoma, where we can get almost 100% fidelity between the cell line and the tumor itself. So this is now available as a web app. You can classify any tumor. It works best with poly-A fresh frozen, but we're working on incorporating paraffin and non-poly-A library prep. So I encourage you, if you have RNA-seq data and you're interested in using our platform, um, please uh, reach out. Uh, so though our initial atlas was very successful in showing us uh, new things about tumor biology within sarcoma, it didn't uh, have a full repertoire of clinical data, and it also was missing much of the diversity of sarcoma. Again, sarcoma is so diverse. Uh, so we went through and downloaded all the data we could find. Uh, we expanded our um, atlas by about 900 uh, samples, just like that. And this is the old atlas, and this is the new one with that extra 900 samples. And what we can see is that we broadly maintain the structure, so we do maintain this stem high, stem low axis, uh, but we also have many, many more uh, diagnoses available to us, and again, this is important for our classifier as well, because now we can classify successfully many, many more um, cancers. And all the new tumor groups have a little star, so uh, just to highlight a few, we have alveolar soft part sarcoma, um, uh, GISTs as well, and, and rhabdoid tumor of the kidney. So when we look at our expanded osteosarcoma clusters, we find a couple of interesting things. This is about uh, 50 new tumors now integrated. We're working on getting more. Instead of four clusters, we now get six. Uh, and all the new samples, of course, are these little uh, dots. And when we look at how the clustering changes when we add more, uh, what we find is that broadly we maintain the same clusters, um, but we do get some new ones forming. And when we look uh, at the gene expression signatures, our master regulator uh, of uh, cartilage, SOX9, there's still a very uh, chondroblastic cluster, and our master regulator of bone, SP7, there still is an osteoblastic cluster as well. So we do maintain that histotype-based um, clustering. We also see that our prognostic value of our uh, clusters is maintained and actually, in some cases, improved by getting more samples and, and actually integrating more clinical data from the samples we already had. Uh, we can see that this orange group, uh, 0004, uh, apologies for the long names, um, actually has broken off from our initial high-risk osteoblastic cluster and seems to have um, a more specific prognosis, and so we can really go more granularly, and if we study the gene expression signature there, uh, we can pull out, perhaps, again, uh, ways to target uh, these high-risk uh, tumors. So we're currently adding to this atlas. We have very active uh, sequencing efforts uh, for samples from Toronto, so we're really raiding all the biobanks we can to pull out all the fresh frozen tumors we can. Uh, we have two projects, one with the Gabriella Miller Kids First Pediatric Research Program in association with the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative here in the States and a program through Genome Canada. And we're adding a further 1,000 sarcoma and mesenchymal tumors. That's our goal. And we're going to include a number of osteosarcomas from a variety of uh, patient subtypes and also across the age range. So we want to in uh, include both pediatric and uh, adult and young, and, and young adult uh, osteosarcomas there as well. And we're, of course, always looking for collaborators, both to help us build the atlas. If you have uh, compatible samples, please reach out. We want this to be a community effort, and we believe that this is really uh, the way forward for osteosarcoma subtype discovery. And also, our classifier is available uh, if you would like uh, to classify your samples. Please reach out. And with that, I'd like to thank my lab, Dr. Federico Comitani, who, of course, this was really uh, his child, this project, and Adam Schlein, my PI, and, of course, our collaborators in Toronto and abroad. Thank you.
Good morning. Um, so uh, I will be talking about long title, a systems biology approach to defining um, heterogeneity and master regulators in osteosarcoma. Uh, and I have no conflicts to disclose, and these are some reportable disclosures for our collaborators. So as we well know in this group, um, the genomic complexity in osteosarcoma that's really marked by many structural variants poses challenges for advancing precision medicine. And as you can see in these circos plots from patients in the target study, really no two patients look alike and there's significant interpatient genetic heterogeneity. And while many studies have started to define the landscape of genetic alterations in osteosarcoma, we see that many alterations occur in only a small subset of patients. The ones that are more common, like TP53, um, are not directly uh, druggable. And then the alterations, when they do occur, occur in this complex genetic background that modifies their downstream effects with multiple pathways affected. And this really makes molecular risk stratification and therapy selection difficult. And so we wanted uh, to address this using a novel uh, precision oncology approach that was pioneered by my mentor, Andrea Califano, that really looks at cancer as a disease of aberrant proteins, not genes. And what he found was that really cancer cells are highly stable biological systems with tightly regulated um, transcriptional programs that maintain tumor homeostasis similar to how normal cells maintain their homeostasis. And it's these transcriptional programs that really reflect underlying tumor biology more than the mutational state, than even copy number alteration or gene expression, as uh, this example in the TCGA breast cancer cohort shows, where protein activity really strongly clustered patients into biologically relevant subtypes. And how we define these transcriptional uh, programs, which we call the oncotexture, um, is based on something called the tumor bottleneck hypothesis. And this states that to really uh, have a uniform disease phenotype like osteosarcoma, all these diverse genetic alterations upstream should really converge and induce a barren activation of a small handful of what we call master regulators that work together um, in tightly regulated checkpoints to then implement the transcriptional program in the cell. And the Califano lab has developed algorithms that infer the activity of these master regulators using their uh, downstream targets as a multiplex reporter of their activity. And these master regulators are rarely themselves mutated or alternatively expressed, but as has been shown across many cancer types, they're responsible for homeostatically maintaining the tumor cell state, they can analyze the effects of upstream mutational events, and they're a new class of pharmacologically accessible biomarkers. And so we infer protein activity by using first a network-based algorithm called um, Arachne uh, that allows us to take large-scale gene expression data and reverse engineer context-specific regulatory networks of um, regulatory protein target interactions. And we can then use an algorithm called Viper to infer the activity of regulatory proteins in an individual sample or even an individual single cell by looking at whether its known targets are, are enriched in the differential gene expression signature. And so this uh, Viper pipeline has now been applied in two New York State CLIA certified clinical tests. Um, one is called Oncotarget and infers the activity of about 300 directly druggable master regulators. And the other is Oncotreat, which really predicts drugs that are going to uh, reverse the activity of the most dysregulated master regulators or the full tumor checkpoint in a sample using differential protein um, activity that we obtained by high throughput drug perturbation studies in molecularly matched cell lines. Um, and these algorithms have been recently uh, validated in end of one uh, study at Columbia in collaboration with the Kung Lab at Sloan Kettering, um, where we enrolled over 130 patients with some of the most aggressive malignancies. We uh, obtained tumor RNA sequencing data. We generated patient derived xenografts of their tumors, in which we then tested the Oncotarget and Oncotreat predicted drugs. And the results were quite remarkable, where Oncotarget and Oncotreat predicted drugs in these highly resistant tumors had over 80 percent um, disease control rates compared to less than 5 percent in vehicle controls um, or in randomly selected tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And so with support from the Hyundai Hope on Wheels uh, Foundation, we built this um, amazing team to try and apply these innovative technologies for osteosarcoma to see if we can define these novel master regulator dependencies uh, with a goal of defining prognostic biomarkers and new therapeutic approaches. So we first began by looking at bulk RNA uh, gene expression data across over 200 uh, patient samples. We reverse engineered an osteosarcoma-specific uh, regulatory network. And um, here we show a heat map, um, unsupervised clustering of the patient samples uh, by protein activity, uh, which is the color of the heat map. And what we find is two distinct uh, groups of patients uh, with unique master regulators, which are in the rows. 
And uh, patients from these two clusters showed significantly different uh, survival. And patients in the high-risk cluster showed activation of master regulators like FOXM1, CENPF, TOP2A, which is a known tumor checkpoint that's recurrently seen in the most aggressive malignancies, while patients in the low-risk uh, cluster showed activation of proteins involved in immune regulation um, and interferon gamma signaling. And this was further seen in a pathway analysis of the most active master regulators, where the low-risk group showed activation of innate and adaptive immune pathways, while the high-risk group uh, showed activation of cell cycle pathways. And on the right, we defined the most predictive master regulators for assigning patients to each group through a random forest classifier that performed quite well in segregating patients. Um, and these master regulators are enriched um, in functions like osteoblast differentiation, osteoclast activation, angiogenesis, um, and inflammatory regulation. Um, and really, our goal, it was great that we found biologically relevant master regulators that could stratify survival, but we really wanted to find master regulator reversing therapies that we could offer to the high-risk patients. And this is where we ran into trouble with the bulk RNA sequencing data. The bulk oncotarget oncotreat predictions were limited for many patients. Um, there was a lot of heterogeneity, and the in vivo validations did not pan out, as you saw in that amazing preclinical study across the adult cancers. And so at the same time, new single cell data was emerging, and these two studies were published that provided single cell osteosarcoma uh, gene expression data. And we thought this could be really useful to address two confounders from bulk data. One is stromal infiltration of non-tumor cells, and the other is intratumor heterogeneity, meaning the tumors comprised of distinct cell states that would both dilute the gene bulk gene expression signature. And protein activity is particularly well suited to analyzing single cell data, which um, has a major challenge of gene dropout effect, where 80 to 90 percent of your genes don't have, uh, have zero reads in the cells. Um, but we use hundreds of genes as a reporter assay for proteins activity, so that allows us to infer activity of proteins that may not be expressed in the cell. And it also does well in identifying lineage markers and um, rare subpopulations. So we began by first uh, clustering the single cells by gene expression using Surratt and annotating cell type by single R. Um, we subsequently inferred a copy, single cell copy number variation with infer CNV uh, using lineage match normal uh, single cell populations as a control. And what we found, and this is an example of one sample, but across all the samples, that they had these transformed subpopulations that had very conserved copy number alterations that spanned the fibroblast, osteoblast, chondroblast, and chondrocyte lineages. Um, and we found that, um, as kind of we expected, across these samples here, you have first heterogeneity in the amount of stromal infiltration that you see, where you can see in some samples the majority of the cells are actually non-tumor compartment. And then when we um, looked at the tumor compartment specifically, clustering by gene expression really separated out uh, patient-specific differences, not biology. Whereas when we looked at clustering by protein activity, and I will show that here, um, we identified really three distinct patient-independent clusters that really segregated with these single R predicted lineages. And these um, different subpopulations were present in every patient, um, albeit at varying proportions, which now makes me think is likely related to the bulk clustering into these groups that uh, John Nash just mentioned. Um, and again, each of these has distinct master regulators and oncogenic programs. Within the fibroblast population, we see metabolic reprogramming um, and stromal kind of regulation uh, pathways being high. In the chondroblast population, dysregulated proteostasis um, is evident. And then in the osteoblast population, we see activation of the epithelial mesenchymal transition, which can be associated with things like stemness and tumor invasiveness. And these are the master regulators um, that segregate each of these populations. Again, the osteoblast one really has activity of stemness markers, and by cytotrace analysis was predicted to be the least differentiated cell type. And interestingly, we saw the significant enrichment of the master regulators of the osteoblast population in that high-risk bulk patient cluster. And so this makes us think that tumors that have poor outcomes really are ones that are likely enriched in this osteoblast-like population that we predict to be sort of the more aggressive chemotherapy-resistant state. And so, again, now that we know these cell states, we can try to identify drugs that will target individual cell state MRs. And so we are, this is the single cell oncotarget. Um, and here, we're basically now validating six uh, MR-targeting drugs that are cell state-specific in patient-derived xenograft models. Um, and this will also allow us to characterize um, osteosarcoma models at the single cell level, and we are optimizing oncotreat drug predictions um, using drug perturbation data that we've developed in osteosarcoma cell lines. And our ultimate goal really is to define not only prognostic master regulators, but then to be able to define drugs that can be used in the most high-risk patients, and ideally a combination to target the tumor heterogeneity. 
And so I just want to thank um, all my mentors and collaborators, um, especially Andrea Califano, who taught me all of uh, these methodologies, and obviously our funders, Sunday Hope on Wheels, the St. Baldrick's Foundation, uh, and the National Library of Medicine that funded my early career. Thank you. Hi, um, I just wanted to say thank you for um, having me here. I'm so excited to be here. It's really an honor to talk about my research um, at Factor. So I do have a couple of disclosures. Um, intellectual property applications have been filed that are relevant to this work. And just to start with the take home messages, at the end of this talk, I will hope that you leave with um, that exosomes are biologically active vesicles that are secreted into the blood and have potential applications in diagnostic medicine. We de developed an exosomal osteosarcoma gene signature that was prognostic in canine osteosarcoma, and we are now applying that methodology to determine gene signatures associated with prognosis in pediatric osteosarcoma. So osteosarcoma displays a lot of heterogeneity, um, which makes it difficult to determine biomarkers, and there are currently no tests that are non-invasive and able to predict who will respond to therapy, and that's true for both humans and canines. Um, as we know, unfortunately, many patients with osteosarcoma do not survive despite receiving aggressive therapies, and those that do survive are at an increased risk of developing therapy-related morbidities, including secondary malignancies. So really, a test to guide therapy and predict prognosis would have potential benefits for making sure that those patients that really needed the more aggressive therapies are guided to that, and those that maybe don't have uh, as... Um, are predicted to not have as poor of a prognosis could be treated less aggressively, sparing them from these secondary complications. Um, naturally occurring osteosarcoma in the pet dog can serve as an interesting model for some aspects of the disease in humans, as dogs present with a very, uh, very similar clinical presentation, they're treated very similarly, and they progress in a very similar fashion. However, dogs um, are diagnosed with osteosarcoma at a far more common rate than humans, and so again, these features uh, favor the use of canine osteosarcoma as a model for certain aspects of the disease in humans. I just want to touch on exosomes because that's where my work lies. Um, exosomes are microvesicles that are secreted by all cells in the body, and they contain important information that's re uh, relevant to the cell of origin, including things like DNA, RNA, proteins, um, and lipids, and they can be efficiently isolated from biological fluids such as blood. There are some challenges working with exosomes, however, because um, it can be difficult to distinguish exosomes that are relevant to your disease of interest from the vastly larger background of exosomes secreted by normal cells in the body. So essentially, it can be challenging to separate the signal from the noise. And we developed a method to overcome this um, limitation of working with exosomes by using a novel canine osteosarcoma xenograft mouse model. So essentially, we gave um, mice osteos canine osteosarcoma tumors by injecting them with canine osteosarcoma cell lines and allowing them to develop tumors. We then obtained serum samples from the mice and sequenced the exosomal contents and aligned the exosomal contents to a combined canine mouse genome. And we know that anything that aligned specifically only to the canine genome had to originate from the canine osteosarcoma tumors because otherwise mice should not have circulating canine-specific transcripts in their blood. And anything that aligned specifically to the mouse genome relative to the controls, um, we know is indicative of the mouse's response to having that canine tumor. So in doing so, we are able to identify genes that were associated with presence of canine osteosarcoma in the mouse, essentially using the mouse model to filter the signal from the background noise. But we wanted to make sure that this had relevance in our species of interest, so we validated our gene signature in the serum of dogs with osteosarcoma, um, as well as healthy control dogs and dogs with other diseases, and applied machine learning. So now I'll go over some of those results. Um, so I'll focus m mainly on the heat map shown here in A. These are the genes that were obtained from the mouse exosomal um, uh, sequencing, and that specifically aligned only to the canine genome. Um, genes that are overexpressed here are shown in red, whereas genes that are underexpressed relative to the mean are shown in blue. And in doing this, we were able to identify 25 genes that were differentially expressed that specifically aligned just to the canine genome. So we know that these are canine osteosarcoma specific genes. 
Um, we narrowed this list of 25 genes down to a panel of five genes that we validated in the serum of dogs using qRT-PCR, and those genes are shown with the asterisks. So to validate our gene signature, we had um, serum samples from dogs with osteosarcoma, the majority of which we have pretreatment and post-treatment samples. Um, and we used machine learning with our training set being the pretreatment osteosarcoma serum samples, um, serum samples from dogs that were otherwise healthy, um, serum samples from dogs with non-cancerous diseases, and then we had two other non-osteosarcoma cancers of bone. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is just a, a figure showing all of the different machine learning algorithms that we um, investigated, and then we further investigated ones that were more, um, had the highest sensitivity, which are shown in the blue dashed lines. And so uh, when applying our gene, um, our gene signature and applying machine learning to that, we wanted to see if there is an effect on prognosis. So using our post-treatment osteosarcoma samples as our machine learning test set, we um, we applied machine learning, and if our machine learning algorithms were able to detect osteosarcoma after therapy, these dogs had significantly worse progression-free survivals um, compared to dogs where, our, uh, gene, where machine learning was not able to detect our osteosarcoma gene signature after therapy, as shown in this Kaplan-Meier curve here with progression-free survival times. Um, so we propose that this is due to the ability of our gene signature to detect minimal residual disease after therapy, which would, of course, have an effect on prognosis. So brief conclusions from the canine project. We identified this osteosarcoma exosomal gene signature using a novel xenograft mouse model, and we um, determined five genes that we further validated using canine serum. And our results were predictive of molecular remissions after therapy, suggesting that there could be potential um, detection of minimal residual disease. Now moving on to um, current work. So we're currently um, uh, evaluating our gene signature in the early detection setting. Um, we are enrolling more dogs with osteosarcoma to um, validate our, the predictive value in an independent data set. And then we're applying our gene signature to otherwise healthy dogs that are considered to be at an increased risk of osteosarcoma development. So these are large and giant breed dogs that are otherwise healthy. And then um, we are also working to apply our methodology to determine gene signatures associated with prognosis in human pediatric osteosarcoma. Um, so this study consists of two aims. The first is to do similar methodology to what we did in the dog study using human pediatric osteosarcoma cell lines. So we will establish um, xenograft mouse models using a panel of six established um, human osteosarcoma cell lines, um, each differing in metastatic propensity. We are obtaining serum samples from these mice, and then we're following the mice with imaging and um, clinical monitoring, and then ultimately with necropsy to determine those that develop metastasis. And then we're going back and looking at serum exosomal signatures that are associated with the development of metastasis. And then the second aim of the human biomarker discovery is that we are hoping to obtain serum samples from human pediatric osteosarcoma patients at the time of diagnosis. We will sequence their serum exosomal contents, and then we will look for features that are associated with the development of metastasis. And in doing these two aims together, we hope that we will be able to determine a more robust gene signature associated with prognosis in pediatric osteosarcoma. I just want to mention that um, we think about liquid biopsies as being very beneficial in the early detection or at the time of diagnosis setting, but there are other potential applications for a diagnostic test that was able to predict prognosis, including um, throughout therapy to monitor for recurrence of disease, and then if metastasis is to occur, then we can use tests such as this to, um, to guide therapy. So in in closing, my take-home messages, again, are that exosomes are biologically active vesicles that are secreted by cells, and they contain information that's relevant to their cell of origin, um, meaning that they have potential applications in diagnostic medicine. We developed an exosome biomarker signature that was prognostic in canine osteosarcoma, and we are now applying that same methodology to determine gene signatures associated with prognosis and human pediatric osteosarcoma. Um, I'd like to thank the um, following funding sources and as well as acknowledge all my lab mates, my um, great group of students that I have this summer, and then all my collaborators, and then my committee on my KO1. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me, uh, and particularly uh, for the, the travel fund to Isaac and, and family to en enable me to, to get here today uh, from um, the north of England. So I'm going to talk to you about the iconic study which has been running in the UK uh, for uh, several years now. Uh, and this was developed through our National Cancer Research Institute bone sarcoma subgroup, uh, essentially in recognition of the fact that there were no uh, studies available at all for osteosarcoma patients uh, back in 2018 when we were discussing it. And so the plan, therefore, was to set up a multidisciplinary uh, collaboration across the UK to uh, address some clinical and biological questions and set up a platform for um, interventional uh, clinical trials. Uh, so the funding was generously awarded uh, from the Bone Cancer Research Trust, which is a charity in the UK that uh, funds um, research into bone sarcoma. Uh, Sandra Strauss is a medical oncologist at uh, U UCL in London, and she's the chief investigator. Uh, and so we, she has pulled together a collaboration of clinicians, uh, scientists, uh, and, of course, we have patients involved and, and a named patient uh, advocate, Philippa Vance. So the study um, opened in November 2019 uh, and is very inclusive. The idea here is to have actually no exclusion criteria. Uh, any patient uh, newly diagnosed with an osteosarcoma in the UK is eligible. Um, and, in fact, we can recruit backwards a little bit if they're not recruited uh, on the day of diagnosis, as it were. And uh, in terms of uh, an update from uh, earlier this year, there are um, 222 patients enrolled. Uh, there's 29 centers open. Uh, and so it's recruiting well, even despite the pandemic, uh, it managed to keep recruiting uh, and is recruiting at uh, 7.2 patients per month. Uh, and looking at the um, uh, various centers that are open, UCL being, the, being a high volume center for treating osteosarcoma patients and the lead center um, is recruiting uh, the, the highest volume of patients. And then um, as trialists know, you have the, the tail there of the various centers that are uh, opening later and uh, uh, recruiting at various rates. Uh, and in terms of the data from, from the recent update, um, we have the expected incidence uh, in the younger patients and then again, uh, in the over 60s, the older patients, we see um, patients presenting uh, in an, at an older age with osteosarcoma as well. Uh, so we're trying to capture those patients and the treatment they receive. Uh, and, and in terms of the anatomical sites, as expected, most in the femur, uh, tibia, and then other uh, sites. Uh, some interesting insights already into the clinical care. Uh, there's differences in staging um, methodology, use of mifomertide, about 60% of eligible patients are receiving that. We're looking into that in a bit more detail, uh, and we're collecting data on surgery and pathological response and also complications from surgery. And in particular, we have a, a patient experience component to the study. Uh, the differences in staging, um, well, what was reassuring to see is, of course, patients are getting appropriate chest staging. What's interesting for the skeleton is that higher expect than expected uh, numbers of patients receiving whole body MRI to stage the skeleton versus bone scan and PET scans. Uh, and um, for the purposes of this talk, um, focusing on, on the biomarkers, we collect tissue and blood samples. Uh, and I'll talk about looking for circulating tumor cells. We get a, 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 a sample in a, a streck tube, which is a, contains a fixative to preserve the cells, and that comes to our lab in Newcastle. Uh, another strec tube goes down to Sheffield, also for analysis for circulating tumor cells. And then a, a sample goes to uh, London for um, CT DNA analysis, and of course we're collecting tissue samples as well. We're also looking at 
the routine available blood test patients have just as part of their workup because it's important not to forget about these tests as they can be useful. Some of them are predictive uh, of oncological outcomes such as CRP. So I'll just focus on what we're doing in Newcastle uh, where we have developed a rapid flow cytometry assay um, to try and see if we can detect circulating tumor cells and whether this uh, correlates with the um, disease status in the patients. Uh, so this is a, um, a PowerPoint animation from, I did this in about 2010. So this is an orthopedic surgeon thinking about biology. It's a bit simplistic, but it kind of held up, right? So we've heard in a lot more detail earlier on about the pathogenesis of osteosarcoma and, and um, the detail of the sequencing, for example, uh, when you look at the samples. But in my head, basically, you've got an osteoblast. Distal femur is the commonest site, isn't it? And you've got a lot of... Um, activity there, you have an oncogenic event, you have an osteosarcoma cell. The osteosarcoma cell is overexpressing this matrix metalloproteinase MT1 MMP, which cleaves type 1 collagen bone uh, and allows the cell to um, uh, destroy its microenvironment and can activate other MMPs. Sorry, that osteosarcoma cell was supposed to move over there. Um, but basically, it can allow for activation of MMP2, for example which can allow the cell to escape into the bloodstream. And so using this marker, which has been validated actually by the MD Anderson Cancer Center a few years later, they also did uh, membrane prep studies showing it was relevant. We've been using it uh, to de detect um, circulating tumor cells in patient blood. Um, we use NG2 as another cell surface marker. But finding the, uh, the sarcoma cell amongst lots of white blood cells and even more red blood cells is not so easy. Getting rid of red blood cells is easy. It's a red cell lysis step. And then we put antibodies on. So we put uh, uh, antibody against MT1 and NG2 as our sarcoma markers. And then we put white cell markers on as well, CD45 and CD16. And so what we started off doing is um, spiking osteosarcoma cell lines into healthy volunteer blood and showing we can get that shift um, on the sarcoma markers. And then when we go to the dot plots, um, here we have some residual white cells. Uh, there's no cell spiked in this healthy volunteer sample. A few positive, uh, false positives there. If we've got a heavy spike, we can see them on the flow cytometry plot. But actually, as we reduce the numbers of spiked cells, then we actually, our detection rates are, are variable, of course, because it's quite a rapid, still a bit of a rough test, but it seems to hold up reasonably well. And so when we've looked at patients, so top left, we've um, got a healthy volunteer, and we've got quadrants here, and we're looking at the percentage of uh, sarcoma marker positive uh, events. Uh, so a spiked uh, sample has their 21%. Healthy volunteer is always less than 5%. Here we have a patient sample sent up from London on the bottom left, and uh, the um, potential CTC population there is uh, at 14%. Uh, and then following treatment, that population has disappeared. Uh, and that when we've put this together, so we've done a range of sarcoma types, most of them osteosarcoma patients, and comparing to the healthy volunteers, it seems to hold up. Um, so whether this assay could be used in the clinic, we can turn it around in three hours uh, to look at the um, size of the CT population on diagnosis and perhaps could be used during follow-up um, needs to be explored and as we go on in the iconic study, we'll study this further. We've done f um, additional tests um, look, using the image, team, image stream flow cytometer to get images uh, and have done some DNA extraction and some exome sequencing from potential CTC populations and we're just analyzing the data there. So in summary, CTCs are detectable in osteosarcoma patient blood uh, using a rapid flow cytometry assay. And if we've got enough blood left over, we do some extra analyses as well. Um, and just to mention that the Hamilton family in the UK have generously awarded further funding to keep Iconic going. And uh, this allows us work package one to keep recruiting. Uh, work package two, we're looking at now instigating an interventional clinical trial, which may be a TKI uh, up front um, with frontline chemo, then a work package three is an immune oncology work package, and to continue working and developing patient reported outcomes as well in work package four. So acknowledgements to the iconic team, there's 
lots of um, clinicians, uh, scientists, nurses involved, uh, along with our, our patients. And it is interfacing with, you may have heard of Foster, which is a, a Europe-wide um, initiative, uh, again, uh, same as yourselves in the US, really um, trying to tackle the, the difficult issues in, in osteosarcoma. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dave Shulman from Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, I'd really like to thank Troy for the introduction, Christina for helping us uh, sort of stay on task and stay organized and pulling this together, and, and for the organizers for the opportunity to be here. Uh, this is my first time at Factor, and I just I just can't say in less than 24 hours how energized I already feel. So I'll cover this morning uh, development of circulating tumor DNA as a prognostic biomarker for patients with osteosarcoma. And um, my co-panelists have actually given a really nice background. The problem that, that I hope we'll be able to solve with this is that there are currently no validated molecular biomarkers for patients with bone sarcomas. As you can see, there's a lot of work sort of moving towards um, making these a reality for patients. And you'll also have to pardon me, I mentioned Ewing sarcoma a few times in this presentation, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to why I do that. Um, so osteosarcoma is the most common malignant bone tumor uh, we see in, in adolescents and young adults, followed by Ewing sarcoma. Outcomes have improved, um, I would say, incrementally um, in recent decades, particularly for patients with localized tumors. Improvements have really been quite modest for patients with advanced disease. And I think just importantly to point out, again, as, as some of my co-panelists have, point have pointed out, our, our treatment really carries a very large burden of late effects. And so in the Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see on the right, with contemporary therapy, um, at five years, about 75% of patients are expected to still be in remission, um, which in, in, in some ways is very good. Um, the, the problems are that there are 25% of patients who are not. And then among the patients we do, we do cure, um, there's really a, a tremendous burden of late effects, and we haven't figured out whether or not there are patients who actually may be able to achieve cure with less intensive therapy. And so to kind of highlight this, I'll, I'll give you an example of um, two patients who presented in, in my clinic uh, a little over a year ago. The first is a 30-year-old with a localized osteosarcoma of the left distal femur. The second patient is a 28-year-old with an osteosarcoma of the left proximal femur. And for both of these patients, we do kind of standard staging. We um, see that there's no evidence of metastatic disease. And even if there was, we would proceed with MAP chemotherapy, local control, more MAP chemotherapy, and then surveillance. And we really don't have a good way of saying, is one of these patients' risk of having their disease come back sort of higher or lower? And can we actually risk stratify this treatment to optimize chance of cure and, and minimize risk of late effects. Um, the genome of, of osteosarcoma, in, in contrast, Ewing sarcoma, I think provides a real opportunity to use circulating tumor DNA to try and differentiate patients like this. And so you've already seen examples of, of circus plots that sort of represent the complexity of the osteosarcoma genome shown here on the left. Um, with numerous copy number changes and complex rearrangements. In stark contrast to that, sarcomas that are, are fusion-driven like Ewing sarcoma typically have more, um, we say, quiet or silent genomes with characteristic translocations. And we can use these genomic features to quantify the amount of tumor DNA that's floating around in the blood. And so you've heard a little bit about exosomes and circulating tumor DNA cells. We are really focused on small, stra small double-stranded, um, bits of DNA that are, are um, circulating tumor DNA. So specifically for osteosarcoma, the way we do this is using ultra-low-pass whole genome sequencing that leverages the presence of these copy number changes. In the top panel, you can see whole, whole genome sequencing of a patient uh, tumor sample, and there are chromosomal losses, chromosomal gains, amplifications. When we sequence plasma from the same patient, uh, at time of diagnosis, we can actually see those same copy number changes. We can use an algorithm to then quantify how much of that DNA do we think is coming from the tumor as opposed to white blood cells or endothelial cells in the, the patient's normal DNA, and we get a percent, in this case, 22 percent. 
So we started to ask clinical questions using this technology actually back in 2017 and 2018. We took diagnostic samples from patients who had enrolled on children's oncology group biology studies now um, more than a decade ago, and we asked the question of whether or not high tumor DNA in patients with localized tumors um, confers an increased chance of relapse. And what we found um, is that among patients with localized osteosarcoma, we looked at 72 patients, when you had detectable DNA, which is more than about 3% DNA with these assays, you had an increased risk of relapse. Conversely, if you had low DNA, you had a, a lower risk of relapse. And when we used higher cut points, in, in the case of osteosarcoma, 18% circulating tumor DNA, actually we saw um, really significant stratification. We had a similar finding in localized Ewing sarcoma and metastatic Ewing sarcoma. And we said we, ha we have to validate this in a larger study and see if we can really move it towards the bedside so that it could be implemented in a clinical trial. And that brings us to the inception of the LEOPARD study. Um, this was a study that um, I developed with, with my mentors back in 2017 and 2018. It took numerous years to actually come up with the name, but I'm quite proud of the name. It stands for liquid biopsy in Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma is a prognostic and response diagnostic. And really the primary aim of this study is for patients with localized bone sarcomas to determine whether the signal of detectable circulating tumor DNA at time of diagnosis is associated with an increased risk of relapse. This was very much a collaborative effort. Um, the study again opened in 2018. We have 12 active centers throughout the, the US. Um, some of our collaborators are actually here today, which is, is always fantastic to connect. And to date, the study has enrolled 142 patients with localized Ewing sarcoma and 138 patients with localized osteosarcoma. The study was powered to validate those initial findings we had from that 2018 paper. And actually, the osteosarcoma arm closed a couple months ago, which was a really exciting milestone for the study. Um, we're working on data cleaning and getting closer to be able to, to do the actual final uh, analysis of the primary aim. We've sequenced many of the samples from the study, and one of the real advantages to the study is that patients um, who enrolled through our primary sites actually provided serial blood samples as they went through treatment at pre-specified time points. Um, I haven't put up all of the specific time points. There's actually 16 pre-specified time points, um, but the study, again, is powered around that diagnostic time point. So we get a 24-hour time point, and I'll actually use my laser here. We can see at 24 hours, actually, ctDNA levels are, are quite similar and really range from undetectable um, to up to um, 50, 60, 70 percent. Once you get out to here, which is after your first um, doses of cisplatin and doxorubicin, ctDNA levels for the majority of patients have fallen dramatically. But actually, for some patients, remain positive until you get past surgery. And then at end of treatment, the majority of patients on the study have, have cleared their circulating tumor DNA. In um, patients who provide relapse samples, we've seen in some patients circulating tumor DNA levels have begun to rise again. Our, our goal beyond the primary analysis from this study is really to start to say, can we use this framework to ask numerous clinical questions with circulating tumor DNA, actually using osteosarcoma as a model and then applying that to other sarcomas later on using the same technology and sort of analogous studies. But so you can imagine here schematically um, that you use these blood samples with validated assays to ask specific questions at different points in clinical care based really primarily on the burden of circulating tumor DNA that you're seeing at time points. So we, we hope to validate what is kind of the most prognostic cut point at diagnosis in localized osteosarcoma, learn what it means to have low or high minimal residual disease after a month of therapy, after local control. Can we use these for surveillance, as was mentioned in, in one of the prior panels? And then can we use this to help guide treatment during surveillance? Um, there's really many people to thank for this. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the patients and families who participated in these studies, uh, my mentors, Dr. Du Bois and Dr. Crompton, uh, our numerous collaborators and our, uh, uh, our, our funders. Thank you. Good morning. 
My name is Diane Deal, and I'm here on behalf of Count Me In, a part of the Broad Institute. We've just heard some amazing, amazing science um, that really, I think, should inspire us all um, as we work towards better treatments and better cures for osteosarcoma. So what can we do to connect the dots, to better connect the dots? And what can we do to engage with patients who have osteosarcoma? Many years ago now, back in 2015, there was an idea about what can we do to connect patients directly with the researchers. Back then, it was focused on metastatic breast cancer, and out of that project was born Count Me In. We use digital technologies to enroll and consent patients who especially have rare cancers. And we then are able to obtain their medical records. We also ask many survey questions, and then we collect saliva and blood samples, as well as for those who have tumor samples, we are able to collect those samples and perform genomic sequencing. What we're trying to do is connect all of the clinical data with the genomic data in an effort to try and better understand the biologies of disease, as well as to understand what we can do more, um, hopefully, to have better treatments for our patients. Born out of and inspired by Count Me In, the National Cancer Institute, um, as part of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, uh, created the Participant Engagement and Cancer Genome Sequencing Network, better known as PECGS. This is a collaborative effort with Count Me In and four other institutions across the United States. Our objective really is to directly engage and work with diverse groups of underrepresented cancer patients and survivors. We are trying to address the gaps in our overall knowledge of genomics in very rare and highly lethal cancers. The Count Me In organization and doctors Katie Janeway, Suzanne George, and Jenny Mack were able to receive a grant as part of this network. We are focused on osteosarcoma and leomyosarcoma. Our goal for the osteosarcoma study is to consent 1,000 patients across the United States and Canada. We will then retrieve their medical records, do a very deep medical clinical abstraction of those medical records, survey patients, survey loved ones, and then collect the biologic samples. We're going to be doing whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing um, from pairs, uh, normal and somatic pairs, as well as also potentially looking at CT DNA from the blood. One of the main points of this network and this study is to better understand how do we directly engage with patients? And how do we ensure that patients that are across the country and across Canada who maybe are not being treated at some of the large cancer treatment centers, how do we ensure that their voices, that their experiences are heard? And so part of this research is not only the genomic piece, but also really the human element and the patient experience. To join and learn more about part of this project, we have a specific website that is dedicated to this project, where you can go and learn more, you can enroll, and you can really share with others um, participating in this project. We are trying, as we've done in many of our other projects at Count Me In, to really utilize digital technology and to really use social media um, to engage with patients and loved ones. We have a presence on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. In-person meetings such as these are so important and we're so grateful that we're past that awful stage where everything was uh, in a virtual context. We're also trying to understand, because this is such a rare cancer, what other collaborations can we engage with across uh, other research centers and biobanks. We're also really hopeful in trying to engage more physicians in helping us with the enrollment and helping us to really um, drive the study. And we're also continuing now to engage across the scientific community by attending many conferences um, over the course of the years. 
We have created materials. What we also understand, though, is that sometimes digital uh, is not always the best way of outreach. And so we are re-engaging and kind of going back to basics and utilizing paper uh, and printed, um, printed cards to distribute to patients so they can take it back and uh, learn more and, and think about joining and enrolling in the study. One of the differences in this study, as opposed to some of the other uh, Count Me In studies, what we've heard over the years from patients and participants, such as those that are in the room today, is that it's great to be part of these studies. They're very happy, everyone is happy to answer the questions, to share their medical records, to spit in the tube, and to collect some extra blood samples. But what we've, what we've heard loud and clear is that, yes, it's, it's great to hear the big results, the overarching study results, but I want to know more about my own samples. I want to know more about my own genetics um, from my cancer. And so as part of this PECGS study and part of the osteosarcoma project is we are working on returning shared learnings to all of the participants who agree that they want that, those learnings. And so a really critical part of our workflow and our process is now collecting those samples and having them run through the CLIA laboratory uh, at the Broad Institute and working with genetic counselors um, to return those results um, to our participants. And then really understanding how the impact of those data and the impact of those um, experiences with the genetic counselors, what does that mean? And what does that mean from a research standpoint and a future standpoint? So we're very um, hopeful that you know, we continue to grow this project and that we're able to really work more closely um, with patients with osteosarcoma. Um, as of the end of May and uh, more recently, we are, this is a, a, a um, accrual chart for the number of participants that we have registered and consented. Um, just as of a couple weeks ago, we're over 100 osteosarcoma um, participants. And we are now really starting to, because we've been able to abstract many of those medical records and look at the pathology reports, we're able now to be collecting um, more and more tumor samples. Um, what we are finding is that because we currently collect FFPE samples and because of the decalcification processes often, that we're, we're finding some trouble with those samples. So we're also investigating, um, looking at the fresh frozen samples and potentially um, trying to do some uh, additional experiments and some additional work, uh, especially with the Rare Cancers Research Foundation. So we're very hopeful that we're on track um, to really uh, build the cohort um, so that we have a good scientific impact. So what I'd like to do now is just simply thank all of the researchers across multiple institutions at the Broad, Dana-Farber, Boston Children's, and Harvard, uh, as well as the team at Count Me In. But most importantly, to thank um, MIB um, for always being a wonderful partner and many other organizations that we're working with, and all of our participants who have enrolled in our study to date. To, be more, to get more involved and find more information, um, we have, like I said, the website for those that are interested in joining the research study. And I also implore all of you that are physicians and researchers um, to share this project um, with, your, um, with your patients um, and with the families of the loved ones. And we do have a table here uh, today, so stop by. I have many of our, our team under, members, Ben, Shifa, Jordan, and Maeve here today, who can tell you more about the project and who can answer uh, any questions you may have. Thank you. All right, so now we have um, a little bit of time for questions, so. Uh, quick observation first, uh, Kurt Weiss, Pittsburgh. Um, that's as good a scientific session on osteosarcoma as I think I've ever heard. So Christina, where are you at? Tip of the hat, that was fantastic. <laughs> I, I, I think there's like a silhouette of me on the back of the wall from the force of your data hitting me. 
Um, but my, my uh, questions uh, specifically for, for Josh and Giovanna, um, one of my contributions to the community is to be relentless on reminding people about the importance of metastatic disease. And so I'm wondering, Josh, in terms of uh, the, the actual tumors that you looked at, and Giovanna, the building of your algorithms, were there any uh, examples of osteosarcoma METs and per potentially any match sets of, of primaries and METs uh, from the same patient that you incorporated uh, into your work? Uh, but to, to all the, the authors on the stage, tremendous. So, um, yes, I think it's uh, very important to kind of understand the differences. Our data set does have uh, samples that are metastatic, um, like lung metastatic samples that were sequenced, as well as primary samples, and there are some matched pairs, but the numbers are quite small. That's definitely an area that we're curious to expand and try to really look at kind of differential activity in the metastatic samples. Among the single cell samples, a couple of those are also primary metastatic samples, two of them. Interestingly, sort of the, at least the tumor heterogeneity didn't seem, you know, it was still um, similar to the primary samples. I do think it'd be curious to look at the tumor microenvironment more at the single cell level from those samples. Um, and then acquiring kind of serial samples, I think, is really key um, over time to be able to understand uh, the changes in the samples from different locations. Um, so definitely an area that I'd be curious to expand. We do have some data, but obviously aggregating data among all our groups would be key, I think, to be able to answer those questions. Uh, yeah, great question. So at the bulk level, we have um, a smattering of metastatic tumors um, within our osteosarcoma uh, clusters, and we also have um, multi-sample uh, uh, from the same uh, patient as well. And what we do see is that there is no change uh, in the transcriptional cluster between the primary uh, and the met, and this is independent of treatment as well. So it seems like there's not uh, at least in our data set, very much plasticity between the primary and the MET, but it's definitely an area, too, that is we need to explore. And, yeah. Yeah, and one quick thing I just want to mention, we did see that in terms of our classifier for predicting outcomes, that was really independent of disease stage of diagnosis, and we can also see with um, there are metastatic samples that fall into the good outcome group, and they tend to have closer to 60, actually, percent survival, which is pretty remarkable for someone with a metastatic disease. So there is something different in terms of biology there as well. And so different, um, I think there is differences heterogeneity in the actual biology of developing metastatic disease among patients. So it's much more complex even than just understanding how, the, you know, you develop metastatic disease to begin with. All right. Um, I'm actually going to take moderator's privilege just for a quick second. And you, you've already had like a great comment, so I mean, you know, we're, we're going to... Fair enough, sure. <laughs> um, so, so everyone up here is, generate, is, is in the process of generating or analyzing tons of data, right? Um, and then we're pulling in clinical data, so on and so forth. But how is this actually going to be used in terms of when we're taking clinical data, we have different EMRs. They don't actually talk to each other, right? Um, when we're talking about uh, um, aggregating the data and warehousing the data, how many, how many repositories are we going to actually have, or is it going to be put into a one federated repository that is easily accessible, reproducible, so on and so forth? We have the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, which is very similar to what Count Me In is doing, except Count Me In is you know, more disease-centric. All of the biomarkers work going on. Like, how, how do we actually take all of this amazing work that's being done and put it into a singular package that we can kind of put a nice little bow on and make it accessible for researchers, for patients, for providers, so that it actually goes more, it, it, it's more than an academic exercise, but it's something that we could actually put into practice and put into motion. And that's a question for everyone up on the panel. I'm excluding myself because I'm the moderator, so, yeah. That's a very difficult question, yeah, so I guess one is. of the two of us who were like yeah. slated for the difficult questions can start. And I think we have some experts in the room who are much, have a lot more knowledge about this. Um, you know, I think that actually is a question I was thinking as I was listening to all of these talks is something that hopefully, if you come to the leveraging computational bio session is really the first question um, that I put up is, 
we are generating a lot of data and it seems like we're all using kind of that same data in different ways and it takes so much effort to aggregate that data, harmonize it, especially the genomic data. Um, and so I think that is a very important next step. And I know the Childhood Data, um, Cancer Data Initiative is working toward this and I was part of a big effort um, across institutions to try and harmonize sort of uh, the collection of data, especially from the EMR, um, as well as genomic data um, that's not typically reported. Um, and I, we all submitted data from our different institutions. I'm not sure where the NCI is in the process of harmonizing all that data, it's, but I know it's, it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress, for sure, um, yes. And would be an invaluable resource so that we all are actually starting from the same point instead of each taking kind of a smattering of data. Um, and I think at the same time, not just the data, but then aggregating the tools that we're all using to analyze that data and making that accessible is really important. From a, from a count me in perspective, um, our premise has always been that the, the data is available to anyone, anywhere who wants access. So we currently, um, once we have the annotated data, um, especially the genomic data, that is released into CBioPortal, uh, dbGaP, and additionally, any researcher who wants the raw data, we will gladly share that with you. There's, there's no reason why we, we sit on the data. Um, we are also, through the Broad Institute, looking at other opportunities for sharing more broadly the clinical data. So a lot of the databases obviously focus on, on the genomic or the chemical biological data, but we're also finding a lot of really wonderful information in all of those medical records. And we're, we're really trying to work both with CBioPortal but also internally within our Terra platform at the Broad. Um, for releasing more of that de-identified uh, clinical and patient-reported data and linking that with the genomic data. I think we have a long way to go, and, and there's many, many other tools that are up and coming. We saw a lot today, but there's also a lot of promise with, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence to try and connect the dots. The, the question is, how, what, how do we do that? Because there's so many different sources of data, and I think we're looking, looking to organizations like the NCI to try and help us, you know, figure that out and other institu institutions across the world. Josh? Yeah, thanks. Um, still Josh Schiffman, still from Utah, at least the last time I checked. Uh, so I want to sort of take uh, a cue from, from you, Troy, and ask a question. But I don't want to ask the panel, I want to ask my colleagues in the room, the, the clinicians, as w for the human patients, but also for the dog patients. So I'm sitting at the right table here, so I'm going to put you guys all on the spot. So amazing scientific data, right? Very compelling. You have me convinced. A lot of discussions about ctDNA, prognostic signatures. This goes back to a conversation that Dr. Reed and I were having at breakfast, is how do we move this into frontline? therapy, right? I 100% agree. You guys have figured out we can predict who's going to do worse. But how do we use this data? What is it going to take in terms of a clinical trial design or, or, or what further data do we need so that we can start putting this into practice and actually change therapy before we even start on day one? So I open it up to my, my colleagues if they have any thoughts on how we can start using this. Dogs or people? Well, I, I think it's easier to do it in dogs because there's no standard and there's no regulation. Um, but uh, as, as my colleagues who actually treat the animals, uh, there, there are considerable challenges and barriers to the animals in creating standards that apply across institutions. I think with kids, there's uh, huge barriers. there's an unwillingness to change anything until it's, it's proven. And so it becomes a chicken and an egg problem, right? Like you can't prove it because you don't get the cases and you don't get to try it, but you don't get to try it because it's not approved. And so I, I think it's a really, really good question. Um, as, as Kelly and I have interacted with our colleagues at COG and other places, uh, we have faced this idea, I think Giovanna put it really nicely, that maybe you can, um, and, and I think a few other people, I, th I think Dave also said, you know, maybe we can figure out if there's a way to treat kids with less intensity to avoid the later effects. And what we have heard back from virtually every surgeon, medical oncologist, radiation therapist is that will never happen because we can't take the risk that 
we put a patient on less therapy and then they relapse, even if you're telling us that you have a 99.999% confidence that they won't. So I think you've identified a really big problem, just like the metastatic disease is a really big problem. Um, and, and it's easier for those of us that are not facing the, the patients or the families to come up with theoretical solutions. I think it's, it's much harder for the people in the, tr you know, the, the generals can devise a, a war plan, right, right? But the soldiers in the trenches are the ones that have to carry it out. And, and I think it's really, really challenging. So um, I, I don't, it's, a, it's a comment. I don't have a really good answer other than to say it's a really big problem and I share your concern. So let's, say, let's in, figure it out. But yeah, in yeah. my job as moderator, I'm gonna say we're done. <laughs> um, but I will say, this has actually been a very active, there's been a, this has been a very active uh, session in terms of Slido. So um, we'll make sure for everyone who posted questions on Slido, we'll make sure to get back to you. And um, I just wanna say thank you for the engagement. Thank the panel, um, wonderful work.